Welcome, I'm Rose Martin, and we're right around the corner with one of Roanoke's own New York Times bestselling author of Factory Man. I'm sure you've heard of this book, you've probably done it with your book clubs, but it's a story about furniture, family, and globalization. This riveting story tells how John Bassett III, battling offshoring, kept manufacturing local and helped save an American town. But not only that book, today we also have True Vine, and that's the story of George and Willie Muse, two African-American brothers, six and nine years old, who were kidnapped by a bounty hunter and sold to the circus and forced to be sideshow exhibits for 28 years. But that's not the heart of the story because their strong mother, Harriet, and she's one of the heroes, bravely fought to get them back and to get justice for her family. If you haven't read these books with your book club, I know you're going to want to. So let me stop talking and let's introduce our guest who's a champion for the underdog, a champion for all of those that we um, marginalize in society. Let's welcome our guest, Beth Macy. Thank you, Rose. Glad Hi, to Beth. be here. Oh, it's so nice. And thank you for inviting us sure. to chat about these two books. I know we could spend the entire half hour with one of these books, and we're <laughs> going to try to, get them, try to get them both in. And let's start with Factory Man. It's a personal story for you, right? Sure. Um, I was a longtime newspaper reporter here in Roanoke, 25 years at the Roanoke Times, and I would set out to tell the story of what happened. Uh, after all the factories closed in Martinsville and Henry County. And it resonated with me because I grew up in a factory town, not unlike Martinsville, a little town in Ohio called Urbana. And um, we were pretty poor. I was the first person in my family to go to college. And my mom worked in one of the factories. And when she would get laid off, she would pick up under the table jobs like babysitting or waitress work, uh, much like the people that I set out to interview. Mm -hmm. uh, in Bassett and Martinsville and so that when they would do things like give me their mother's cell phone number because their own was about to get cut off I knew what that felt like and that was really the driving question behind the book like what happens to a community when half of its jobs go away and I was lucky enough to also unearth kind of this great heroic story about this guy who didn't close his factory and, and, and that became kind of a family story. It became a story about international trade, which I, at the time I, did, I knew very little about, and sort of this legal drama as well. So it was just a, a rich way to talk about American history, really, because the history of the factory is a, in large part the history of America. And kind of where we are now in America you know, has a lot to do with um, a lot of the factories closing. You're right, and let's dig in a little bit there, because I too come from a, a family that my dad worked in the factory, and I was the first one to go to college. So as I'm reading Factory Man, I'm thinking, oh, I remember what that's like in Cleveland. I remember what, what that was like for our families. So you come across wanting to tell the story, and the Bassett family, the furniture makers, they're making furniture, and all of a sudden we've got these imports, and they're, they're having wood, but they're making it cheaper, and John Bassett decides, okay, I've got to figure out how they made this chair, right? This Louis Philippe chair. So he's heading over to China and pick up the story. Right, right. It's actually a dresser. There's a dresser that just come on the market in China. And this is like 2002, three. And they're selling it, they're wholesaling it for $100. And his son Wyatt goes, wait a minute, there's no way they're doing this and following the rules of the WTO or the World Trade Organization because you're not supposed to underprice your product. They were actually selling the stressor for less than it cost to buy the wood to make it. Hmm. And so what John did in the factory or had his, his people in the factory do is they deconstructed the dresser, priced out of the parts, and then proved to themselves, based on another market economy, how much it would cost. And it was indeed, the government was subsidizing it, which is not supposed to happen under mm -hmm. the rules of the WTO when China joined in 2001. So he, he, he and Wyatt, his son, kind of go undercover to China to meet, this is how the book opens, to meet with the owner of this factory over there, who basically says to this very kind of privileged person, John Bassett, you know, grows up in the town of Bassett where his family rules everything. He says to him, you must close your factories and put your business entirely in my hands. And that didn't go over well. No, but he <laughs> didn't say anything, which is not very much like him. <laughs> and uh, so he goes back and they do all this research and they end up filing the world's largest anti-dumping petition against China, which they went on to win. And that's why I say he helped save an American town because that when helped him keep that factory going. It's still going, still making wooden bedroom furniture in Galax, Virginia. And, but it's a complicated story because, you know, 
it's not a job that pays a lot still, but there are entire families that work in that factory, and it's really kind of, help, it's the largest employer in town. Well, and there's a lot of families, family intrigue within the Bassett family themselves, which you've woven so beautifully into this story that you've got this burly character, John Bassett, and all of these other family members that are that are playing a real integral role into how all of this happened. And I'm wondering, you know, he's, he's bound to determine he's going to keep that one piece open. Yeah. Right. And so talk a little bit about how all those other family dynamics maybe played into his, you know, his belief that he's going to, by gosh, he's going to keep this open and he's going to make it successful. Yeah. Well, that's a great question because <laughs> I think that has a lot to do with why he files the largest dumping right? petition <laughs> in the world against China from a town better known for bluegrass and barbecue. Right. Like who does that? Yeah. And I think one of the things he doesn't, he would never, I don't think, put it like this, but I think part of his mission was he wanted to show the folks back in Bassett where he had grown up and where he had parted ways in 1982, kind of how, who the real factory man was. Yeah. And so he grew up in this town that his grandfather had basically started. Bassett Furniture became the number one furniture maker in the world in around the 60s. And in 1982, he got in a big fight with his brother-in-law, who had sort of elbowed his way up to the top, and he couldn't take it anymore. His brother-in-law, Bob Spellman, was the CEO of Bassett at the time. John got mad and left, and he went to run uh, another company called Vaughn Bassett, which was also started by his grandfather mm -hmm. in the early 1900s and his wife's grandfather. But it was a separate company. It is a separate country. It's a privately held company. and. Um, so he's back at this very small, very struggling factory in the 80s and 90s. And meanwhile, everybody starts closing their factories and importing cheaper stuff from China and Vietnam instead. And he says, you know, what about all these families, these generations of these families who all over the South and in North Carolina and Virginia uh, made our families wealthy with their mm -hmm. work? What about them? We're just going to turn our backs on them. And that's when he figures out that um, the Chinese are cheating, as he puts mm -hmm. it, and he files this this dumping uh, petition, which is complicated and complex, and and maybe not the most interesting part of the book, but I think because it's so important, and he's got this fire behind him because of what had happened to him, it it becomes really universal, you know. Mm -hmm. It's so I had to kind of dig into the details of what happens at at the Do Department of Commerce and the International Trade Commission. Um, you know, why why it is all these factories closed and, and how that was allowed to happen and what do we do for the people that were left behind. And, you know, talking about digging into things, you really do, and I hope that everyone, when they read this book or they do it with their book clubs, they really appreciate all of those little details that you do dig so much to bring to light in here. In fact, you even took a trip to Indonesia as a part of research. That's taking research to a new level. <laughs> right. Well, I wanted to see, um, you know, kind of what it was like. I mean, the big argument for international trade, uh, other than we can all buy cheaper blue jeans and bedroom dressers, uh, is that, you know, we're elevating society in these rural, impoverished countries. And so when we went to Indonesia, it, it was true. I was interviewing people who had just been working in rice uh, paddies and fields just mm -hmm. a few years earlier. And for the first time, they were joining the cash economy. It was a lot parallel to what it had been like in Bassett, Virginia in the early 1900s when John's grandfather started Bassett Furniture Industries, employing uh, former slaves, former sharecroppers, and people from the hillsides who would like walk miles into the factory uh, by lantern light in the morning. I mean, it, so race relations kind of weaves its way into this story in a really important way also. Absolutely. So at the time, uh, furniture making was already pretty strong in North Carolina, and J.D. Bassett, a, a wily sawmiller, mm -hmm. uh, John's grandfather, said, you know what, if we hire the African-Americans here, uh, we can pay them half. So it's just a progressive, right, because he's going to yeah. hire him, whereas his competition isn't going to hire him at all. They're going to relegate him to a share, uh, sawmilling and sharecropping. But if we hire him, uh, we can get that great labor and we can pay him half of what we're paying the white people. So from mm -hmm. the very beginning, uh, they've got their competitive edge because they're making those hiring practices. So it's just mm. a complex story. It really is. And one that deserves the time to really dig into and tell so beautifully. But the story's not ending with just this book, is it? 
There's things that are coming up soon that people might be getting excited about. Oh, sure, yeah. So it's been optioned by uh, the actor Tom Hanks. Um, it's going to be a film. Um, it's, you know, they hired a screenwriter, and Tom Hanks wants to play John Bassett. And so hilarious when I, when I call John Bassett up on the phone to tell him that Factory Man's been optioned, you know, and uh, Tom Hanks wants to play you. He's, he's excited. But he goes, just remember, the higher the monkey climbs up the tree, the more it shows its ass. <laughs> <laughs> so don't go thinking <laughs> right. you're all that, <laughs> right. Missy. He's, yeah. um, constantly putting him at me in my place. But no, I think he's thrilled. And as the consummate businessman is that he is, I'm sure he's thinking, I'm going to sell a lot of furniture. If, uh, uh, right. If Everybody's going to want dressers. Right, right, right. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, it is that, exciting. That is really wonderful. When your book goes across the country, do you get calls from people about um, participating in book club questions? I know you have a Facebook page. Yeah. That people can. Have an and, author page. And an author page. Now, is that you? Um, they're contacting you and you're trying to keep up with the people and being a part of the Me book and my club husband. across the country? Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> great. Well, and I think that's important for people to know that, sure. you know, as as we're watching this show and no matter where it goes, that people will say, gosh, if I click on Beth Macy's author page or I click on Factory Man page yeah. and we have a discussion through our book club, we can actually contact you. We can exactly. actually talk to you. Exactly. And both of the paperbacks have interviews in the back, like a Q&A with me, mm -hmm. um, which has like, you know, just some additional information and a lot about the reaction of both of the books. And, um, and my website, which is authorbethmacy.com, also has the list of speaking engagements that I have coming up, which I haven't updated, but I will. Um, I have a new book coming out in August, and I'll be kind of back on tour um, late summer and early fall for that. So uh, hopefully coming to a city near you to talk about the new book. And which is exciting. And we'll get into that. And I want you to promise to come back when the sure. new book launches. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so you moved from reporter at the Roanoke Times into novelist how has that changed your writing or changed your approach to telling a story sure so when you go from like a newspaper article to a book length narrative nonfiction, i mean the 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 building blocks are still it's the reporting it's that context and that you know knowing doing your homework before your interviews so you can make the most of your time but you have so much more time to spread out in a book so both books cover about a 110 uh, year period. And so I had a lot of time to develop, you know, the family stories, um, kind of what's going on with race issues in Truvine, what's going on with the circus issues there, the same with the globalization, you know, you see the emergence of the factories, how, how, how they took manufacturing from the Northeast and brought it South mm -hmm. in chase of, in, in chasing cheaper labor and how then the same thing happens to them a hundred years later when the stuff moves over to China and Asia. So, I mean, it's really, it, it, it's cool to be able to just kind of relax and, and to tell more of it, but, it, but it's, but it's a puzzle too, you mm -hmm. know, that's why I have my, um, my timelines up in my office that, cause it, it's just a, it's a puzzle to put it all together. What's happening in the fifties in furniture, what's happened in John Bassett's life at the same time. And then you uncover a piece that might be a little treasure that you can pop into a section and yeah. be like, oh, I didn't know that. Or you're searching for something, right. That, right? Right. And you talk about the time it takes. Let's transition to True Vine a little mm -hmm. bit. 25 years 25 years making to bring yeah. that book to life. Yeah. So the first time um, I heard about the story, I was driving around with a newspaper photographer um, who had grown up in Roanoke hearing about it, but he wasn't sure if it was true or not. And what he said that piqued my interest, he said, it's the best story in town, but nobody's been able to get it. And I'm just competitive enough <laughs> that I thought, I can get it. I, uh, right. And, the and reason, you did. Yeah. The reason nobody been able to get it is because... Um, the gatekeeper of the story was the niece of George and Willie Muse, mm -hmm. the great niece. And she ran a little soul food restaurant on Melrose Avenue called The Goody Shop. And Dawn had told me that. So I kind of waltzed in in the early 90s and asked if she'll let me do a story on her famous great uncles, one of whom is still alive and in his 90s, Willie Muse. And she points to a sign on the wall that a customer made for her. And the sign says, sit down and shut up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and she meant it. And she's I mean, she in charge, okay. She wasn't playing. And so, um, but I'm persistent. And her mom was in the kitchen peeling potatoes and watching The Young and the Restless. And I mm. thought, that's my in because 
Um, I actually saw the very first episode of Young and the oh, Restless. You did? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and watched it for many years. So I'm back in the kitchen before Nancy knows it with her mother Dot peeling potatoes and watching Young and the Restless, talking about the characters. And so I convinced Dot that Nancy should let me do a story on a restaurant, which eventually she agrees to. And it was a funny story. And then eventually, over a couple years, she said that she would let me write a story about Uncle Willie and his brother George after Uncle Willie passed. And so he died at the age of 108 in 2001. And she let me and a co-writer at the newspaper do a piece. Um, and we were able to confirm a lot of what the family thought, but there were still a lot of kind of mysteries about mm -hmm. it. And so, you know, I didn't know then that I was going to be a book writer. So I just kind of held on to the story in my mind. And Nancy and I became friends over the years. I mean, she's still, you know, she's not going to give me anything that I don't deserve, right? Like, right. she's not going to bend over backwards to help me figure out the story. But um, her restaurant would be a place I would go to when, well, because the food was great. And also because um, it was a great place where I'd go for story ideas. And she would help me, you know, mm -hmm. kind of with my reporting over the years. So that when I asked her if I could turn the story into a book, right before Factory Man came out, um, she she made me wait a while because she had to check with the other relatives in the family and then she called me six weeks later um, on Christmas morning and, oh. <laughs> and, and said she would give it to me as a gift oh. and that she'd let me do the story. So, But there was a lot um, that I was able to dig into and uncover that was uncomfortable mm -hmm. and, and she knew I would find out sad things and so she said just remember that in the end they came out on top. And they certainly did. They certainly did. And Nancy, I see she emerges as that second hero in the totally. story, right? We've got yeah. Harriet first, and I can't imagine, and they were, parts of this were tough to read, but that was the reality of, of the time. And you, you read through that and you realize that the strength of these women and also the resilience of the Muse brothers to just still have such an outlook of, the fact that despite what they had been through from you know being kidnapped right there out of the fields and then spending that 28 years as exhibits that was really really hard yeah and i the way you kind of take us through that part of the story from the beginning parts i don't even know what that was like to try to unearth that and put those words to paper and mm. then so what was that like well, the, you know, it's an imperfect story because I couldn't find out exactly what happened to them in every moment. But I was able to find a lot of new uh, material. Mm -hmm. I was able to uncover a lot of new material and, then, you know, but almost raise as many questions as I could sure. answer in some ways. But what I did was I tried to find out where they were in their careers at di different junctures and interview lots of experts. But because, it, you know, a lot of it happened 100 years ago, I would find a fact, like a photograph, the first known photograph of them as child exhibits. So mm -hmm. here's proof. You know, you could tell their children. There they are in their little uncomfortable suits. And I would do things like um, send the photograph to experts who know about historical costumes. And they would see things that I wouldn't see in the picture. So any fact, that, that hard fact that I would get, I would try to learn as much mm -hmm. of it as I could. And then constantly sort of telling uh, the things that I was learning to Nancy and getting her reaction and to other experts. Um, but it was, it was a frustrating book to write at turns because um, they were written about thousands of times. They were very famous in their day. I mean, the circus was the number one form of entertainment in America between And you know, at first I was offended by the circus part of it. And then I thought, this is not really about the circus. You know, yes, that was part, the circus mm -hmm. was woven into that. And you're right, how they were taken and then renamed how many times? Many times, um, yeah. Eight, um, ten. Going, I mean, right, yeah, to yeah. however it benefited the circus. Right, so, so they could make money. Right. So always that the exploitation theme in both yes. books. Um, but some of the best material that I think in the book isn't so much about George and Willie and their time on the circus, but really about what's happening in Jim Crow, Virginia, back home in mm -hmm. Roanoke, mm -hmm. which is remains still one of the most segregated mm -hmm. cities mm -hmm. in Virginia and in the South. And the neighborhood where they're from, which is the West End, still the most impoverished neighborhood in Roanoke. And so a lot of what I do is I would drive around that neighborhood with different people in their 80s and 90s and, and, and older, mm -hmm. um, trying to bring that neighborhood to life. Like, sort of to answer the question, were the brothers better off in the circus or were they uh, better off at home? You know, mm -hmm. because once they got to come home and knew their mother was alive, which they were very grateful for, 
um, they eventually chose to go back to the circus. It's really, it's right. not the expected narrative in no, a lot of and ways. and that surprised me in the book that they decided to go back, but then when, you know, then they're getting paid for, for doing it, but then, and I don't want to give so much away, right? Because we yeah. want people to pick but it up it's complicated. It. It's, yeah. it's complicated, but then, you know, she gets a couple of different attorneys to help her. Yes, but just she does. this mother's love and entrenched with making sure that these boys, you know, were going to be taken care of was just the heartwarming part of it too right. when you saw how hard she fought. Right, and this idea of getting justice for her family no matter yes. what. And it goes on for like 20 years, she's mm -hmm. doing that. And then later in life, Nancy has to do the same thing for Uncle Willie right. when he's 103 and he gets burned accidentally in the hospital mm -hmm. and she has to kind of, you know, get a lawyer and get tough and she that does it. That was one of the tough ones, tough parts I me know, too. I know. Yeah, that, that got to me. Um, would you be willing to read? Sure. Some yeah. Okay. Heck yeah. Um, I thought I'd read the part about what's going on the day in 1927 when, um, when she's going to go to the circus and she thinks maybe her sons are going to be there. This is chapter nine, the prodigal sons. The idea when it first came to her was so bold, it was practically suicidal. She could have been arrested. She could have been killed. Harriet Muse could not have read the advanced press Dexter Fellows had spoon-fed and finagled Roanoke Times reporters into writing in October 1927. The world's largest circus is here. The newspaper trumpeted in a preview story about the upcoming spectacle of four locomotives, 100 rail cars, 1,600 people, five rings, six stages, and the circus's most famous star of the moment, a special guest, albino elephant from Burma. It was the first time the combined Ringling Brothers shows had ever played Roanoke, and Ringling's advance team had been busy placing newspaper ads in the weeks leading up to the performance. The billing crew plastered handbills for the two shows all over the city ahead of time, and the adjusters secured the usual permits. The big one, as the circus was called, had just recently grown from a four-ring to a five-ring affair. At the Roanoke Fairgrounds, there was no whites-only sign posted, but this was the same venue where the KKK rallied, and blacks across the South already knew they could not just wander the showgrounds at will. In Louisiana, for instance, officials had gone to the trouble of mandating racially separate ticket booths and entrances and exits down to the declaration that black and white accommodations had to be 25 feet apart. While carnivals performing week-long stays typically set aside a midday week as colored day or black achievement day, circuses that played just one day afforded no such access. Blacks arriving at a one-day event such as the 1927 Roanoke show would have had to view the big top performance from a restricted area in the back of the tent, the back end blues as show people called it. So then I, you know, then I go in to talk about kind of what was going on with Ringling at the time and I'll, let me just get back to, to what's going on with Harriet. Um, indeed, the biggest threat of danger on this day was not to any circus employee, and it had nothing to do with the usual unpredictability of Circus Day, that rare moment when country and city life converged, when preachers got to see the wonders of God's animal creations but also rubbed elbows with some of the drunkest, meanest people in town, when middle-class farmers and townsfolks were put within eyeshot of educational but naughty hoochie-coochie strip shows, no, the greatest danger that day was to Harriet Muse, who'd made her way from her clapboard shack on Ten and a Half Street through the downtown and to the fairgrounds in suburban South Roanoke late that afternoon, probably by streetcar. For decades, Roanokers would speculate about how she learned her long-lost sons were playing that day in the circus. Maybe a neighbor had seen them performing earlier in the day and sent word. Maybe one of the families Harriet did laundry work for casually mentioned noticing one of the posters plastered all over town. Maybe one of her other children, now grown, heard of, heard of it through the Jordan's Alley grapevine. Her granddaughter, Dorothy, Nancy's mother, Dot, had, been just, had just been born to Annie Bell and Herbert Sanders on October 4th, just 10 days earlier. That little girl would grow up hearing a lot about Harriet's brave actions that day. Discussed at every family reunion and every Sunday potluck, the story would become the muse's single most vivid piece of lore, passed down like tales of a grandfather's war heroics. After all those years of searching and worrying, Harriet woke up the morning of October 4th with an absolute certainty of where she should go. Her husband would be of no help to her. That was nothing new. The last thing he thought they needed now was more mouths to feed. Harriet was entirely alone, but she was convinced, and she was unflinching. It came to her as she was sleeping, Dot told me in a 2001 interview. She saw it all in a dream. Go to the circus. 
Oh, let's not tell anymore. <laughs> we want people to know what happened when she showed up at the circus that day. I am so sorry that we are out of time. And I am so intrigued by your ability to kind of get under the skin of the surface of these American stories and these really important stories about everyday people, our neighbors, who are, who are living and working right where we are. Um, you know, we've still got so much to learn and reading, reading the book, learning about Willie being an elder and how, how prolific he was and how strong Nancy was too, right? I think to myself, not only do we have a lot to learn, not only do we still have a lot to be grateful for, but it struck me how Willie, despite everything that he went through in his life, would constantly say, God is good to me. Yeah, God never better. is good to me. Mm -hmm. And you've been so good to us to be here with us. So special thanks to you, Beth, for sharing your books with us, both of them, Factory Man and True Vine. It's been a fascinating show. And if you have not read these books with your book club, you need to absolutely do it. And I'll be around next time. And I want to see you right around the corner. <laughs>